Hey, good day, everybody. Welcome back to our Working Together series live with uh, Rabbi Carmen Ingber. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we're uh, being hosted from uh, the Nativ Center uh, in Houston, Texas by Rod Bryan. It's always a joy. Uh, we've been learning uh, Nehemiah, and it's very, very, very interesting stuff. I'm not sure where Rabbi Ingber is going to take it today, but I'm sure it's going to be great. So make sure you like the video out there or feel free to share it on social media. So let's just jump right in and say hello to Rabbi Ingber. Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Good to see you all. We are continuing with the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah, and uh, we're in chapter five. Like I said, I picked I picked this, one of the reasons I picked this um, uh, safe for this book to learn, as I said, is you see a lot of the machinations of different things, because as opposed to things in the Torah, which you see more miraculous, this has to come under the guise of the world of nature. So, Let's continue and see some of the stories that are going on, some of the political machinations in Nehemia that he's got to deal with and hopefully guide through our own machinations in the world that we live in today. So chapter five. Now, what happened was, again, the Jews came back um, to to Israel. Now, you just got to get the picture here, because when the uh, temple was destroyed, so the Jews were all exiled first to um, to uh, Babylon, and the place was literally destroyed. Uh, same thing in the beginning of the second temple. Also, the second temple was destroyed. The place was barren, uh, it, it, as you as you've all I'm sure heard the famous. Um, statement by Mark Twain in the 1800s when he went to Israel and he saw this barren land and he couldn't believe it in his pictures of it. And that's why like, the whole story that the, the the Arabs were saying, oh, we were there the whole time, it was all nonsense because what happened was God cre- set it up that the land would not give its produce only to the Jewish people. So when the Jews were exiled, the land was essentially barren. In many places, very, very barren. Uh, There's one statement that says uh, in the Talmud that a bird didn't fly over the land of Israel for 52 years. So you really had a barren place for a while. So now the Jews are coming back, but things were very difficult. Similarly to when the Jews came back in the recent times, you know, people think the 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 state of Israel started in 1940. That's not correct. It's not correct. In the 1800s, um, the the Jewish people always had some people staying there. Uh, There's a synagogue I used to pray in in the old city called the the Ramban Nachmanides Synagogue. That was established by Nachmanides in the in the in the 1400s in the 1300s, I believe it was. No, 1400s. I think. Um, and what happened was Nachmanides was living in Spain. He was invited by the king of Spain to a debate. There was a t- student of, of Nachmanides called Pablo Cristiani, who was a her- heretical Jew who th- said he could beat Nachmanides in a debate. Nachmanides asked the king, King Ferdinand, for permission to speak freely, which the Jews never had right to speak freely in a debate, because <laughs> that that kind of you know yeah, kind of hampers your your ability to win a debate because you can't say anything that would be called heretical. So uh, he asked for freedom to speak clearly and freely, and the king gave it to him, and so Nachmanides won the debate. And it was uh, he wiped the floor with this other guy and he just proved it was ridiculous everything he was saying. And what happened was so they started to say that, oh, Nachmanides lost the debate. So Nachmanides wrote down all of the arguments of the debate to show it. We have the book today. It's called Sefer Vikuach, the book of the debate by Nachmanides and has the debate. And as a reward for this, he got threatened with his life. He had to run away and he ran to the land of Israel. They set up a synagogue there, and, you know, that's that was hundreds of years old. So there was always like a small Jewish presence. In the 1800s, the Jews started coming back to the land of Israel. There were two great rabbis at the time, the uh, students of the Baal Shem Tov, the students of the Vilna Gon, who uh, were sent by their teachers to go reestablish the land of Israel. So just so you should know, historically, like, like political... Uh, modern Zionism, which starts in the 1900s, the movement to return to land of Israel was already happening very strongly in the 1800s. 
there was the uh, um, the uh, there was the, the few wealthy Jews that were backing it. Moses Montefiore and Rothschild they were backing Return to Zion, and Jews were going there. And 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 what happened was in every town, my my my, my mother's town, they told me about. She told me about this, like. You know, before the Holocaust, there were people in their town that would go live in the land of Israel, which was desolate, poor, you know, and they would gather money for them in Europe and send money to them to live. And that was called the Yishuv Hayashan, the the original settlement, you know, coming back to land was in the 1800s. And the people had no money. There was no, there was, there was, there was no agriculture. It was desolate. The the, the land started flourishing in the 1800s when the, the some of the um, people who had some money, like the Moses Montefiore and and uh, and Baron Rothschild, they started setting up some industries in the land of Israel. By the way, and this is important to know just for politically, because the Arabs that came to the land of Israel. And this is well documented in the book called uh, um, "From Time Immemorial" by John Peters. John Peters was hired by the by the Arabs to write their story, and she started researching it, and she changed her mind. So this is not correct. This is not what happened. And she wrote a book that said this is all a political scam, and she wrote the real story. So you want to see the book? Interesting book called "From Time Immemorial," and she writes there that for every Jew that came down to the desolate land to reestablish it, for every Jew that came, a hundred nomadic Arabs came from the, the 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 different places to get some some food and some work. So when the Jews started returning, that's when when really Arabs started coming in because there were not many of them living in Israel. They were nomadic. They were living in other places, Syria, Lebanon, and they would come into the land then. And that's how they would get get work. That's similar and an introduction to chapter five, because chapter five, you got to see it in that context. You got to understand that they came back to the land of Israel and there's very little food. Places the place was desolate. They had to rebuild it. And what happens is, is that now all of a sudden they're building the wall. You know, Ezra came back and restarted and, he, and, and, and they finished the temple. And then Ezra came and he established, you know, all, all the strength of the people. But it's 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 there were small uh cadre of people surrounded by enemies. And 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 there's very there's not a lot of money. So in chapter five, the people under the yoke now, and they're working all the time to build the wall because the Chemia's mission was we got to make our efforts to protect ourselves. So the people start crying out in chapter five and the people cried out and they said, listen, we, we, we don't have we have no money for food. OK, their 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 lands were mortgaged. They, 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 they had to borrow money and they were in debt and they couldn't make money because they're building the wall. Okay. Now, a couple of things I want to, I want to, um, I want to discuss here in the beginning of this, in, in the chapter five from verse one to basically till verse um, six, where they talk about how bad things are. First of all, they say something that our children are being made into slaves. I just want to talk about that one second to talk about what is the Jewish position? What's the Torah position on slavery? Understand that a little bit. What does this mean? Because it's important. So first of all, slavery is forbidden. Um, even though I had to explain to you what context when we're talking about slaves. So there's, there's two different kinds of aspects of slavery in the world. What in America used to be called an indentured servant which means you owed money and you paid, you worked to pay off your, your uh, um, debt. The second thing is called a slave. That person owns the, the body as, uh, you know, a, of the person. So that is forbidden. Just important to know that a, a, a nations of the world cannot take another person and make him a slave and own his body. They could have him work for them. And similarly, a Jew cannot take another Jew to make him work for them as a slave they own the body. That's forbidden. Um, so that's important to know. There is an exception that you may have heard about called the Canaanite slave. And it's a very different phenomenon where a Jew would have a person that they elevated him spiritually. He actually was a Canaanite that can 
actually this and you see the story with Moshe the Moshe made the the people they were they were there were there were people who came to Joshua and to Moshe and said uh, that they were they were from far away nations they wanted to come and they were they were lying and and Joshua said he would not he would not they can come part of Jewish people and he said it wasn't true and he made him two Canaanite servants so a Canaanite servants a little different because Canaanite servant is actually an elevation of status they have laws as a Jew in many Many areas and they they go to the mikvah and they and they become spiritually elevated that's the only exception to what we're talking about of the idea of a slave on the whole the idea of owning a person is forbidden can't do it not only that is it forbidden the the talmud says that if you go and Talmud recommends strongly against being an hourly worker, it calls an hourly worker job a slave to a slave. And sometimes we have to do it. But the Talmud is very, does not like that approach for a human being. It's much better to be a contractor that you are not owned. Your time is not owned by anyone. Of course, that doesn't mean they own your body, but they still own your time. Nine to five, you plug. Now, again, I didn't say people have to do this. I'm not telling a person to go quit their job. But what I'm saying is, is that is that it's very important, the ability to have a person's freedom. And therefore, when it's talking about being slaves here, it does not, it cannot mean physical own slaves rather it's the concept of of they were they were like had to work to the point where there was they own their time that's simply what we have to say because otherwise slavery as as a a concept is forbidden you can't go in a, a non-jew can like another non-jew is a slave and and a you can't another jew is a slave there's the the, the canine slave is the exception of the spiritual elevation of the person but otherwise what we're talking about is there are, there is a phenomenon of something that a person could work for someone for a period of time as a financial uh uh obligation and as i say if you could avoid it you can avoid having your time be owned by somebody else. Do it. If you can't, you can't. But if you can, if you if you can, if you can set it up that you can, you can uh, that you can, you know, trust in God and 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 make your efforts and not lock in a certain amount of time. It's obviously ideal for a person's freedom, which is a good Fourth of July message, I think. Actually, right, freedom. Freedom is is a very very valued commodity. And I always tell you, people don't realize what freedom means, but freedom is crucial. A person has an obligation to become what they have to be in the world, and they have to have the wherewithal to do it. So, if you're locked in a certain amount of time, then that time is you don't you're not owned in that time. Even in Jewish law, it's amazing. Somebody who's an hourly laborer. Has special laws of the of saying prayers. They cannot take a long prayer. They cannot have you know the grace after meals and and for a Jewish person is an obligation from the Torah. Non Jews should also thank God and say blessings and for what they get. But it's an obligation the Torah to be to say say. But the law is is that if you're an hourly worker, you can't go and say, oh, I'm going to be a really righteous guy and say a long prayer for three hours. Can't do that. You know, I'm now I'm a, now I'm a holy man. You know, and uh, normally I finish in one second. Now I'm working by the boss. And I punch the clock, and I have a religious obligation. They can't do that. And the Lord is a very a very concise prayer. He says. So that's the first thing about about being free and important. Now, the people complained they had no money. Now, in verse six, Ezra uh, Nehemiah was very upset. By He was very upset about this when I heard the situation. And says in verse seven, he called all the people who had money, who are the wealthier people. And he said, listen, the Jewish people who had become indentured servants, meaning that they were working by uh, by someone else who, who, who bought them for their labor by the non-Jews, we had to go and redeem them. Because it's an obligation that, that it says in the Torah that if if your brethren was sold someone else as an indentured servant in the sense again in term I'm saying not as owned by as a slave, but you have to go and redeem him. 
So we, we did that. And now you're going to put them in the same situation? So now Nehemia appeals to the people that this is not the thing to do. And he says now, he says now in verse 10, that I am going to, uh, um, I am going to now give them money and the poor people money and food and whatever they owe me, I'm going to cancel it. And I'm going to return to them their, their, their things that if, if you have a, a deposit, a mortgage on their property, I'm asking to return them them, return it to them. Okay. And so Nehemiah makes a plea to the wealthy people to help support the poor people. Okay. Now, he says afterwards, the people agree to this. Okay. The people agree. Okay. And Nashiv says, yes, we'll do it. Verse 12. And we're not, we're not going to ask them for their money back. Now, then it says, the Chaim said, okay, I want to take a vow. <laughs> take a vow. And now he says, if you don't keep the vow, you're going to, your money will be lost to you and all, all of that. Now, I just want to talk about this one second because this gets us to a topic that is um, a very important topic of charity. Charity and about... You know, what's the situation if a person doesn't have money? What are you supposed to do? What do you have to do? And and it really it really is very relevant today because we live in in this world where um, people and I, I talk about it a lot, but it, what's really happened is is that the communist ideals of America uh, of, of of other nations have now seeped into America. So what is the attitude towards this? What is the attitude towards, okay, they have no money. Should you cancel their debt or not? Well, maybe, you know, how does this work? Should you cancel student loans? Should you cancel, you know, uh, redistribute the wealth? What, what, what's, what's the structure? So the answer is like this. I'm going to say it like this. First of all, are you able to hear me? Because I, I said that I'm trying to reconnect on the thing. You guys can hear me? Yeah, we got you. Okay, Rabbi. Okay, good. So first of all, the rule is, is that, that you cannot go and take someone else's money and give it to someone else. There is no such thing as a communism, as socialism. Every person has what they have. There is an obligation to give charity. There is a discussion in the Talmud. Can you force the charity that person needs to give or not? Discussion. But simply put, you cannot. You cannot. Um, the person is supposed to give charity. There were structures in, in Jewish systems where they used to, you know, come to them and say, you have to give the charity and they would push them. So charity. But charity is very different than the tax of redistribution of wealth. It's completely different. Charity works much better, actually, if you if you do it right, and and I and it's very important because the Jewish people have been very careful about this throughout the generations, where they really set up you know like a free loan societies. They do different things to help people, help people get themselves started. As as I probably mentioned to you before, in in terms of the levels of charity, the highest level is actually a loan because. Then you give the person the ability to make their money and they keep their honor intact. So they give you the money back and they turn it. That's the highest form. So to give someone a job, give someone a, a, a loan. But otherwise, there is the obligations of giving charity. That is a commandment or it's a giant commandment. Sure. However, there's not an idea of redistribution of wealth. That's, that's, that's insane. As complete as I mentioned last week, that is called an ignoramus. And at a certain level, it's actually stealing. Um, sure. You know, my son once pointed out to me, if you look in the if you look in the story of Joseph, I think I mentioned this one before, it says that Joseph bought the Egyptians as slaves, adventured servants, whatever you want to call it. And he took from Pharaoh 20% of the people's earnings he took in taxes. Wow. 
At 20%, you're like, all right, you know, <laughs> what does the government take today? I mean, you know, 20%, you're like, oh, okay, that's that's maybe not so bad, you know. Uh, so it's 33%. 30%, and it's 50%. What? 43% is a revolt threshold. Yeah. Is the what, what, what threshold? The threshold for revolt. Revolt. Now, yeah. Where, where did you, what's that? What's that from, Dan? Where are those numbers from? Oh, you know, I can't recall exactly where I, I read it, but uh, yeah, forty-three percent is a tolerated uh, socioeconomic limit, and after that, people start to revolt. So you find in a lot of civilized societies, people uh, they try to keep it as close to it as they can without going over. Right. And then you could say, well, there's a small percentage of people that have more money, so we could then we could take more from because they're too small to revolt. So you could also then say, let's just tax those people. Right. But the point is, is that is that that's not what's going on here. What's going on here is chesed, is kindness, because there is the idea that is there. Every person has what they have. They have their mission. They have their their what their wealth is. What they but they have to take from theirs and give it as an, a statement of, of their own giving of charity. The reason why Nehemia pushed them so much was because it was a time where that's what was needed. It was a time of famine. And therefore, he called on them to go beyond the letter of the law, what they normally would have done, and to give more charity because it was needed. It was a time of famine. The pill came back. They had to build it. They had to build the walls. All of these problems were such that the people now understood it wasn't that what they owned was not theirs. It was theirs. It wasn't the Chemi coming and saying, you know, you this, you didn't earn this. He didn't say that. What he said was that this is a time where it is a time of the obligation to step up and to do chas and do charity. And the people all accepted that. And that's why afterwards, the only curse he gave them is once they took a vow. Because if they, if they wouldn't have done it, they wouldn't have done it. He couldn't force them to, to, to necessarily do all that. But the, the vow, once they took a vow, and they were obligated. And so that's what happens here. So there is an important aspect of every pawn has to understand that they have, you know, uh, um, you know, they have this thing today. You know, some people are saying it's terrible. Some people are saying it's great. You know, the, the end of affirmative action in America, which you know I think is a great thing. It's that every person should be judged on their character and their color of their skin, and a person should therefore, you know, be able to have the abilities to go and to make what they make. Once you make something, we're not going to take it from you, but we ask that a person be kind and do the act of helping people who have less. And here there was certainly that need because the state of the world at the time in Israel and the need to build a wall and the great depression and great poverty they were in. And that's what happens. In verse 13, after the people agree to this, it says, Vayomru kol kahal amen. Nechayi made them take a vow, and they said, Amen, which means, it's true, we will keep this vow. They hallowed Hashem, they praised God. And the people did what they said. <laughs> what was the praising of God for? So the commentaries say that once they felt that God put in their hearts to give the charity, they actually praised God for them promising the charity. And it's very important to understand that. When a person doesn't go and do something that's right, they feel bad. When you do an act that you feel is a righteous act, you actually start to feel good. The people's praise was because they now committed to give charity and they, and they understood. Once they committed to it, they felt this is the right thing. And they were able to part with their money in a very different way. Very important. I want to tell you one other thing on this point here. There's a law in the Torah that says to honor a wealthy person. Now, as a as a freedom loving uh, American, that seems to bother us. What? Why should I honor a person that's wealthy? Well, what does that mean? Because he has money, I should honor him. 
You have to understand what this means. It's very important. It means like this. It means when God gave somebody money, he gave it to them for a purpose. Mm -hmm. They have now the resources to make the world a better place. And that is now a mission they have. And that's why if they don't do it, they're punished, commiserate with the fact that they didn't do that. Mm -hmm. People don't understand. Poverty is a test. Wealth is a test. Poverty is a test that you don't get negative, jealous, and steal. Wealth is a test you don't get haughty. And you don't not give. Because when you don't give then, that person is going to get punished. That's what Nehemiah says. If you don't do this now, you're going to lose all your money. Because the reason to honor is not because you have money. It's because God put you in a position that you're supposed to make the world a better place. And if you do it, you get that honor. If you don't do it, you're a, you're, you're a bad guy. And you'll get punished. It's not like the person says, oh, the guy has riches. So he just sits on them. No, he, he has to do something. He has to, he has to actually use them in a positive way in the world. Okay? Let's keep going. So now, now it's interesting. Nech- Nechemia now says and from that day on, and the whole time he was the governor, he never took taxes from the people. And he needed to. That's how they, that's how they got paid. So he's working for the people, but he doesn't take a salary. He won't collect the taxes that the government gives him. Okay? And Nehemiah says about himself, he starts feeding the people. In verse uh, 17, he has 150 people and from the Jewish people and from the nations of the world that came to also eat by him, that he's supporting. So he is actually now not only not lining his pockets as, um, as a leader. And this makes you wonder, you know, how do some politicians become very rich? It's a fascinating thing. I think there's a there's, there's a Congress discussing that right now. How has that happened? So Nehemiah says, I'm not taking a nickel for this. That, that's really a servant to the people. I think I mentioned to you a couple of times, it's a fascinating thing. Like you see it, the, the, some of these, these preachers with the mega churches, and they're driving around in these like fancy cars. And I, I I've been in the home of some of the greatest leaders of the Jewish people. I was in the home of Rabbi Yashuv Tzatzal. Rabbi Yashuv once called people to to come and to uh, um, protest. They were they were they were going to dig, dig up these graves, and this thing was very terrible. And he said, and he said "Everyone go out and go to this." And and, and there was a it was a beautiful protest. People were sitting there and praying. He just said, "Everyone should go out." Six hundred thousand people went out just from his saying it. Now, if you can command that kind of power to get people to to just almost a million, over half a million people to go out on your say-so, I mean, you could probably rack in the money too. He lived in this tiny little house, the, 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 the part, tiny apartment, tiny apartment. It was like, like two rooms. It was, like, it was fascinating. And that really has always been, it's always been like that. Basically, if you look at very often the greatest leaders of the Jewish people who have the most power, they are doing what they're supposed to do. They're saying, I am here to go and to do God's mission, and they're not trying to line their pockets. And that's what Nehemiah says now. Nehemiah says that that I am not going to take any any money for what I'm doing. I'm going to help the people. That's what he does. Now, Nehemiah here, there's some words here that I mentioned to you once that that the sages have a complaint against Nehemiah with. Even though Nehemiah is very righteous, remember, a righteous person is judged very, very exacting. It's not like, you know, people think, oh, the guy's a saint, so we'll give him, a, we'll give, we'll give, we'll give him slack. No. The more righteous the person, the more the Torah holds them in, 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 in a higher obligation. The reason for that, I told you that many times, is because... When a righteous person is doing something, they don't want the system to be tainted by giving them chesed, kindness. They want to earn what they're doing. 
They want to be exact. They want to be precise. They want to be able to do everything right. <laughs> Nehemiah here does, says two things that the sages have complaints against him. Even though he didn't mean it in a bad way, but didn't come out right. In the end of the chapter, in the end of the book also, he says, Shem should remember my kind, my at what I've done. And on that, the sages say, some say, and he didn't mean it that way. The Malvin says he meant it in a way that, remember what I'm doing should be a blessing for them. But when you say, remember all the good things I did, it doesn't sound right. It sounds like you're taking credit. Like you owe me. Nehemia is held accountable for that. Additionally, he says, and I'm not taking the taxes. And the, the previous governors did take it, but I'm not taking it. So you just say you shouldn't have said that either. Because, okay, you're doing a great thing. But don't don't take, tell, take somebody else's calculation. I don't do this. Okay, you don't do this. So, so what do you tell us about other people? He didn't mean it in a bad way, God forbid. But the sages actually held him accountable. A righteous person has to be very, very careful. So even the great Nehemiah, who's doing a great thing, had to be careful not to contrast it to other people and not to, to elevate yourself in any way. And it's very hard. It's very hard. We would do something good. We want to feel, I did it. Amazing. It's very hard to be that person to feel what I am doing is what I'm supposed to do. It's very hard. Because we all, and, and, and today especially, most people have low self-esteem. And so when you do something good, you, 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 what you want to do is you want to feel good about it. And so how do you? And it's a problem. How do you talk about humility, humility, humility when I, I feel bad about myself? And most people that are, 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 are haughty are really not even haughty. They're really very low self-esteem and they're trying to elevate themselves to make them feel better about themselves. So I always tell you, the answer is, is, is somewhat simple, but very hard to do. The answer is you can feel great about yourself because you are made in the image of Hashem. And therefore, you could feel you're the greatest person in the world because you are. But how did I get this way? Well, because God gave me this quality. He gave me certain certain skills. He gave me certain things. So that's why Moshe, as Moses becomes greater and greater, becomes more and more humble. It's fascinating. You would think the greater he becomes, the more haughty he becomes. But the greater he becomes, the more he understands what this is from God. So yes, feel great about yourself. You do something good, feel good that, that you did it. But don't separate yourself from your source. Because when you do that, then you have to say, you know, and, that, and, that's, and that's really this, this week's Parsha of Bilaam. It's amazing. Bilaam, God talks to him and he says, he says, you know, oh, God speaks to me. And, he, and it's, 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 the sages say, it's, it's fascinating. When the first messengers come to Bilaam, so Bilaam says to God, uh, 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 um, Balak, the king, sent these people to me. And Rashi says what he was saying to God was, maybe I'm not important in your eyes, but I'm important in the king's eyes. That's the craziest thing I ever heard. You're like, you're a prophet. God's speaking to you. What is this obsession you have with your lowliness that God doesn't think you're anything and you're trying to show off to God what it's insanity. It's like, what is he thinking? He's going to impress God that Bilaam, the Balak, the king, sent for me. And why does he think God hates him so much? He's talking to him. Wild. And the answer is, is because Bilaam's approach is separating himself from God. He's called a kosen. He's called a sorcerer. Let me explain this a second. Very, very important. There's a law in the Torah, it says that the Jews are not allowed to go to uh, sorcerers and, and tarot readers and people who see the future. But God will give them a prophet and he'll tell them what they need. So I don't understand. 
so fine. So we got a profit. Hmm. But if the idea is telling me the future, so why why is it better hear from the future from the prophet than to hear the future from from the sorcerer? It says don't don't go and don't go and and in, in, in the book of Deuteronomy, the Roman says don't go to the guys who tell you the future. Don't chase after it. Go, I'll give you a give you a prophet. He'll tell you what you need to know. He'll tell you the future. So is it is searching for the future good or bad? Well, it depends. Depends. The the sorcerer's goal is to find out how the spiritual world works to force God's hand. Because he's separate from God. Bilaam's not about what does God want and I'm connected to God. His what can I get? How can I force God's hand to get what I want? That's the sorcerer. So the search for the future is a search for something that runs contrary to God. That's, not, that's why he's doing it. It's about knowing how the system works to manipulate the system for his own intention. The prophet's not about telling you what's... The prophet is now that you, you are connected to your source, you will know the things you need to know to know how to go forward, but not, not because you're trying to manipulate to get to what you want. It's a very, it's a, an incredible, it's, it's, it's in, in the ethic of our father, it says, make your will God's will, and then he'll make other people's will your will. Meaning that what's happening is, is that when you think I want something separate from my source, you're in danger zone. You're in danger zone, because at that point, you got your own agenda. That's what Bill was about. Yes, he was a prophet, but he felt he was so low in God's eyes because he knew he was competing. He wasn't trying to say what's God's will. The prophet, that's what the prophet is trying to do. <laughs> understand what God wants. And when you understand what God wants, so yes, God will tell him. Okay, so you need to know the future in certain cases to know what's going on. It's a completely different objective. Okay, And that's what we have to do. We have to feel good about ourselves, not because... Oh, yeah, this is who I am, and I made myself. No. I feel good who I am because I was created in the image of God, and I was given these qualities, I was given these skills, and therefore I must be beloved, and I must be valuable, and I must bring those out in, in, what, in what I'm about. And it's very beautiful then. Right? Make sense? Excellent. Okay, let's go on a bit more. So now we are up to, uh, that is chapter five, chapter six. Chapter six brings us back into, and again, one of the reasons I learned this book with you, brings us into our world of global politics today. Because the good guy often does not look like the good guy. The bad guy is the one, the guy who's calling you a crook, very often is the thief. And if you don't believe me, just look at the politics. Spin doctors. It's it's quite amazing. And that's a, a statement from the sages. The sages say, whoever disqualifies, disqualifies with their own iniquity. When you go and you say, the guy says, you're a thief. Check him out. Could be there a thief too. Or could be there a thief and you're not, hopefully. But that's what's happened. So that's exactly what's happening in America. It's happening across the world with this situation. And it's no different in what's happening in the Chemia. The guys who are looking like they are the, the righteous, holy people, have good intentions, are not. But let's see chapter 6. When the enemies of the Jews, Sanbalat, Tovia, Geshem, and the other enemies saw that the wall was finished, they didn't put the gates on yet, but they had the walls finished. They they started they started trying to create issues. <laughs> Literally, like all the stories you see in politics, and they presented a certain way, and that's not what's happening. So they sent messages. The messages to Nehemiah. Listen, we gotta meet. We need to have a, a summit. You know, we want to help you. We want, we want to help you. But Nehemiah understands that they're actually going to kill him. So Nehemiah does not trust these characters. And they keep saying, listen, we have to meet. 
There's stuff going on. And Nechemi realizes that they're going to try to kill him. <laughs> they send messages to him. He keeps pushing him off. He says, I, I can't. I'm busy. I'm, I'm building the wall now. I, I'm, I'm not available. Fine. Keep sending him messages. Send Sanbalat, one of the enemies there, one of the leaders of the, the political parties that are in control there. Send another message. And he says now, it's gone out throughout the world, throughout the nations of the world, that the Jews are rebelling. They're rebelling against the king. And they're building the wall, and the word's out. And the word is that you're going to become the king. Okay? And there's even prophets. Now, here's the question, what they mean, prophets or people speaking? But the word is out that you are being proclaimed as the new king. And that may be a problem because you were sent by the king of Persia to be the governor, maybe, but now you're taking the king. Now let's get together, you and I, and we're going to, well, I'm going to try, and I'm going to try to help you. Okay? Because I, I know what's happening here. The word's going out. You're not, Nehemiah knows this politician is lying. He knows Jeffrey Epstein did not kill himself. He knows all the other shenanigans are all a big lie. He sees right through it and he says, uh, no thanks. Okay? He says to him, listen, I'm not playing your game. Stuff is all made up. I'm not worried about it. Never happened, never said it, not engaging. Okay? So, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to push us away from our mission. And that's really what it is. And as I told you last week also about how to deal with the politics, keep your mission in mind. Keep your mission and don't get stuck in, in, in their games. So you're trying to get us, you know, off track. So we're gonna we're gonna buy into your story. That's not it. Sure. So now what happened was Nehemiah gets a message from this guy called Shemaiah, Shemaiah Bendalia, who was an ascetic. He was a guy that was pretending to be a holy man. Okay. Pretending. Remember, there's still prophecy amongst the Jewish people. This guy is pretending to be a holy man. And he tells, he tells Nehemiah that, listen, I'm on your side. Your enemies are coming to kill you. You should go into the temple. There's no gates in the doors of the walls of the city. Go in the temple and lock it up and stay inside the temple. I'm going to kill you tonight. So Nehemiah says, listen, first of all, I'm not running away. Okay, I, I am, I'm, I'm the leader of the people here, and I'm not going to go and hide. I'm not doing that. That's first of all. And second of all, you're sending me to go into the temple? I'm not a Cohen. I'm not a Cohen. I can't go to the temple. Now, this is a little tricky because Nehemiah understands this guy's a, a, a false prophet because he's telling him to do something that's forbidden. Now, the question is, if a prophet says something to do something that's forbidden, does that mean he's a false prophet? So there's two different categories. If a prophet comes along and says to change one of the Torah laws... That is a sign he is a false prophet. He must be killed. And it said many times, that's a verse in the Torah. And that kind of undoes a lot of religions. That's a pretty straight one. Doesn't, and the Torah says, I don't care what he does. The guy could do miracles. Doesn't matter. So even if he does phony miracles, but if he does real miracles, it doesn't make a difference. He says, do one thing against the Torah. You you kill him, he's a false prophet. Now, there is an exception, though. 
a prophet that's a known prophet that says as a one-time thing to go at one for one moment to do something that's not in the Torah, <laughs> it's an accepted prophet, that prophet you could listen to. Who is that? That's Elijah the prophet. Elijah the prophet had a showdown with Ahab, Ahab, where they offered what offerings on Mount Carmel. That was the temple. The law is you could only bring offerings in the temple. But Elijah the prophet knew he was told by God it's a one-time thing. He could do it. So the prophet changes it forever, nullifies the law. He's a false prophet. The prophet comes along and says one time, then he could possibly be a real prophet. But he has to be a known prophet. So this guy is not a known prophet. It's not clear he's an established prophet. And Nehemiah takes it as even a one-time thing. You're not, you're not an honest prophet. You're a false prophet. And so Nehemiah does not listen to him. That's verse 12. Nehemiah realizes it's not from Hashem. And he realizes that this guy has been bought. This guy is a, a politician, and he's bought. Amazing. Okay. And now, Nehemi again prays. Okay, to Hashem. To, to, to punish them for, for their, their lies. And Nehemi finishes building the temple, wall, the, the walls around the city, I mean. And he finishes building that. And when the people, the enemies of Israel, hear the temple, the wall had been finished to be built, their hearts melt. Because they realize that this is a major change. And it says they realize it's from Hashem. Which is a fascinating thing to say, really. Because this whole story of Nehemiah is happening through natural means. And so you wouldn't think these heretics would re- see that it was God's hand. But at the end, they realized, and they got afraid because they realized we did everything we tried and could to destroy him, and nothing worked. Okay? And at that time, there were um, there were many uh, enemies of the Jewish people who were trying to go and to, and to, they were politicians. These guys were had connections, they had power, and, uh, and they were trying to stop Nehemiah from his work and stop the Jewish people from rebuilding the walls and serving Hashem properly. And uh, they were trying to, to stop them, but they were unsuccessful. And we're going to see next time in chapter, chapter uh, um, uh, 7, we're going to start seeing there at the completion of the gates of the city and the and the the completion now when Nehemiah gets them all back into a safe place in Jerusalem and they're able to really establish now the second commonwealth. Okay, questions, comments, thoughts on what we said.